Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Welcome to our conference, Sin Etiquetas, by Vivian Fernandez de Torrijos, in commemoration of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I'm delighted to be your host tonight, Ms. Annie Lam Chong, pa Panama's Pavilion Director. And uh, well, tonight, I want to ask you, what do you know about Panama and its inclusiveness towards persons with disabilities or what UEA, UAE refers to people with determination? Well, Panama is building an inclusive social model based on human rights and several programs are in place for the benefit of people of determination. We have made regulatory and institutional advances that favor the social inclusion of people of determination. Both the Political Constitution and Equal Opportunity Act um, well, recognizes the persons with disabilities as social interest group and requires the government to create the conditions of their integration in society and the maximum development of their abilities. In 2007, Panama adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its optional protocol aligning itself with social approach to disabilities and agreeing to undergo a review of the nationwide progress made to meet these international standards. The institutional framework for the inclusion was reinforced through the creation in 2007 with the National Disability Office, CENADIS, whose mission is to execute inclusion policies. Panama started to focus on the education of the people with determination. And it is conscious that just guaranteeing equal access of education was the first step to guaranteeing the right to work. Did you know that more than 17,000 children and young people of determination in Panama were enrolled in the regular educational system? And while almost 4,000 attended special educational centers managed by the Panamanian Institute of Special Habilitation. Tonight, we have three amazing, empowering women as speakers. Let's briefly introduce you to them. We have two guest speakers, Erika Nota. She is TV and radio journalist with 25 years of experience in communications. National conference speaker. She is co-founder of the media show Una Luna a la Vez, which is a program dedicated to supporting any parent going through an unexpected diagnosis. Mother of Roberto Luca and Rocco, and is an epilepsy and cerebral palsy advocate for her son Rocco. Our second guest speaker for tonight is Miriam Jimal. She is the co-founder of the Brain Treatment Center in Panama City in Miami. She devotes her time as a life coach to support parents like her who have a child with autism, to accept their child's diagnosis while using MERT technology to help their children's brain processing. She is the founder of Brain Tool Center, a therapy center that supports BTC's patients with conventional therapies. She is also co-founder of the show Una Luna a la Vez and mother of two twins, Marcela and Raquel, and she's an autism advocate for her daughter. Last but not least, our main speaker, Vivian Fernandez de Torrijos. She has 28 years of experience being activist, advocate, and mother that through the experience she learned what to be in the inclusion means. Today, she belongs with other 18 members in the United Nations in Geneva, being an expert commissioner at the Committee on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. She's also the vice president of the Working Group of, Human, of Women and Girls Disabilities. Involved in many projects such as UNICEF and Special Olympics, she's also published her autobiography called, as tonight's um, show, Sin Etiquetas, Without Labels. Vivian Fernandez de Torrijos is proud mother of three, Daniela, Martin, and Nicolás. Daniela, her eldest daughter, was born with sequelae of prematurity and slow development and gave a real turn to Vivian's life. But I'll let her tell you about that with her incredible experiences. Please join me to welcome you to the stage, our first speakers, Miriam and Erika. I never wanted any of this. I know, but you have it. I don't know what to do. You do know what to do. The answers are in you. Why did this happen to me? It didn't happen to you. It happened for you. I'm all alone. <laughs> Look around. We are right here with you.
Raquel was diagnosed with autism when she was two years old. Rocco was diagnosed with cerebral palsy when he was three months old. My intuition told me that something wasn't right with my daughter, but I was too scared to listen to it. I was in denial, trying to numb the pain of something I thought I could never surpass. The first time I heard cerebral palsy, I didn't think it could get any worse. But then the seizure started, and it took over a year to find his real diagnosis, lenos Gastaut syndrome. I felt like I was drowning and couldn't come up for air. Little did I know that through my daughter's diagnosis, I would not only meet the best version of myself, but also learn what unconditional love really is. My son awoke in me a strength that I never knew I had. And through that awakening, I became the woman I was meant to be. A woman with determination to face anything that life throws at her. Una Luna a la vez means one moon at a time. It's a community that stands with anyone going through an unexpected diagnosis because no one should have to go through this alone. Una Luna a la vez is the guide we always wanted. By living one night, moment, and instant at a time, there isn't anything that we can't face. And together, we, we can, can create, create a, a better, better world for our, our children. children. Good for being here. And thank everybody in Panama, in Canada, in Chile, in Argentina, in Mexico, everybody who's connecting right now to see us. My name is Miriam Jima. I have twins, as you can see. They're 13 years old now. But my daughter, Raquel, was diagnosed with severe autism when she was two years old. Now, I believe that every parent of a special needs child dreams of the day when their child isn't special anymore, at least not because of their diagnosis. But if we want the world to see our children as equals, if we want the world to accept our children, something important needs to happen first. We, the parents, have to accept our child and their diagnosis fully and completely and with our whole heart. And to do so, we have to learn how to come out of our own suffering. And that's easier said than done. Because when something unexpected happens to us, something we don't want in our life, we go into denial. And when we're in denial, we fight against three important things. Now, this is something that I've found to be true for my own life. I invite you to take a closer listen and see if you can relate to what I'm saying. When we're in denial, we fight against three important things. Intuition, reality, and vulnerability. And of course, we start with intuition because frankly, we don't want to hear what it has to say, especially if what it's saying is that something is wrong with our child. Unfortunately for denial, intuition is a voice that will not be easily silenced. And before it gets too loud, and we're very afraid of it, we start our second fight, and this time we're fighting against reality. And the fight against reality begins the moment we numb ourselves from it. When you shop too much, work too much, drink too much, spend hours on Netflix, social media, any time you're distracting yourself from your life, you're fighting against your reality. And we don't even notice that while we're busy avoiding our life, our child, our family, our friends, our work, it doesn't get put on hold. These people don't want to play along with our fantasy because they need us. But if we're not ready to face them because our pain is just too great, then the third fight begins. And now we're going to fight against vulnerability. And the fight against vulnerability begins the moment that we decide that to be vulnerable means to be weak. And we will not be weak in front of the world. And we will definitely not let our children be exposed to it. So we build armor around ourselves to protect us, protect us from prying eyes and judgment and criticism and what will people say from society, from labels. But what are we really keeping out? What's the real price of this prison that we have built to protect ourselves? 
We're keeping out what we need most. We're keeping out love, support, connection, empathy. And how could we possibly expect the world to see our children as equals when behind these walls, they can't even see our children? Behind these walls, we can't even see our children because we're too busy fighting our inner voice, avoiding our life, and being disconnected from love. So now we have a choice to make. Do we continue to fight against everything? Do we continue to suffer? And do we make our child's diagnosis the end of the world? Or do we learn to drop the gloves and fight the right fight? Fight towards intuition. Fight towards reality. Fight towards vulnerability. If you're sick of suffering, if you want to break free of your pain, the first thing that needs to happen is that those walls you build need to shatter. They need to drop. And you need to open your heart to the world. And yes, you're going to be exposed. And people might point it, they might criticize, but I promise you, what you're most likely going to find with an open heart is love, connection, support from everybody around you. And when you allow yourself to feel that for the first time, you might just look around and see that your reality isn't as bad as you thought it was. You might just look around and realize that there are other people in your shoes going through the exact same thing you are and that they can guide you and help you. And one day, you might be able to help somebody back. You might even go one step forward towards your reality and ask yourself, what is reality? Is reality the thoughts I have in my head at night? What will happen with my child when I'm no longer here? Will my child be independent? Will my child speak? Will my child get married? Is this reality? Or is this a movie that we play in our heads about the future? Because the moment you question what reality really is, you realize that reality is now. Not the past, not the future. Now, this moment, this very second. And the burden that you feel lifts like magic, like air. And we are light and we are ready to love and receive love and we're ready to support and be supported. And we're ready to look our child in the eye and accept them for who they are. And then the world will be ready to do the same because it came from you. When you look your child in, your eye, in the eye and you can accept them and love them for who they are, then you get the best gift of all. You get your intuition back, which is what all of you and what all of us needed all along. Because our children, they're not born with a manual, but we are. What do you think intuition is? It's our guide. The moment we embrace it, we fight towards it, we will realize something very important. We will never live alone one day of our life, ever again. We'll never have to make a decision alone, ever again, if we learn to listen to that inner voice, fight towards intuition. So because Eric and I know what suffering feels like, what denial feels like, what pain feels like, and what fighting against Everything feels like, but more importantly, because Erica and I know how to be free from it, how to teach you how to be free from it, how to drop those walls and release the pain. This is why we built Una Luna La Vez, which means one moon at a time. Well, thank you for being here. An unexpected diagnosis can move the parents, and we know it, to unexpected situations. Believe me, no one, no one is prepared for this at the beginning. No one. This, no one is prepared for these hurricanes of emotions because we have hurricanes of emotions, new medical terms that I've never listened in my whole life, new situation, new way of living. But how can a mom or a dad or a family, an entire family can handle this? I ask you, is there a book? Is there a guide? Can I Google it? Is there like a, like a pill that can cure our pain as a pill does for a headache? I ask you, there's nothing. So we have to deal with this. And I have been in here in this nine years ago. My son Rocco has nine years. I have been in this road. And even though it wasn't easy, 
and it's not easy, believe me. There is a better way because the light is not at the end of the road. The light is in our road right now. And you will find the light once you meet your resilience. And all, each one of you have that inside. You have just to meet your resilience. For me, the parents of children with determination, we are like lost passengers. We are like passengers that take a plane and we land in another place that we were not supposed to be, that was not in our plans. It's a different destination, yes. It's very different, but it's not a bad one. It's simply different. That destination will surprise you, believe me, every day. But that destination has its own light, has its own shining. And this destination changed our life completely, our planned life, completely. But also this destination showed me, and I'm sure that for Vivian, for Miriam, showed us what life is really about. And that's the most beautiful thing that we can learn in our whole entire life. One luna, one, una luna a la vez, or one moon at a time, was inspiring our children in many mothers, but especially two moms. And one of them is here. Is here there, Vivian. Nine years ago, I was lost in my own pain. And I called you, and I called her. And I knew she was very conscious what I was feeling here, because she was in that role before me. And you listen to me. You guide me. And now, here I am at Expo Dubai with my sister, with my friend, Miriam, with this Panamanian project, this Panamanian dream for the world to encourage the parents of children with determination so they can not be lost in their own pain. Because you know, our children, need parents strong, need parents with a voice, need parents to act right now. And we all are the voices, so we can have a better society. And that's what we do. We are acting right now. We are working right now to have a better world, not only for our children, for everyone, because it's the right to live in an inclusive world, it's the right for every human being. Recently, I read a phrase that I all keep it on my mind since I read it. And I, will I want to share it with you. And it says, once my barn has burned down, I can see the moon. Thank you very much for being here. And now I have the pleasure to invite to this stadium a one of the women that has inspired us every day, a woman that makes a difference in our country. And for sure, you have to listen to her extraordinary presentation. So Vivian Fernandez de Torrijo, thank you for being here. La autenticidad es una elección que requiere coraje, compasión y conexión. Esa compasión y esa conexión, en vez de la empatía hacia las personas con discapacidad, ha sido mi norte y ha sido mi camino por muchísimos años. He sido por 28 años activista, defensora y madre, que por la experiencia supe lo que era entrar en la inclusión. Hoy día pertenezco a ese cuerpo colegiado de 18 miembros de la ONU en Ginebra, ese cuerpo de expertos donde junto con los estados parte le damos seguimiento al cumplimiento de la Convención por los Derechos Humanos de las Personas con Discapacidad. Ha sido mi pasión el involucrarme en promover una mejor relación entre las familias y las personas con discapacidad para garantizar su acceso a la comunidad, a la sociedad. Todo esto para lograr una verdadera inclusión en educación, en salud, y sobre todo para lograr un trabajo digno y bien remunerado. 
Muchas veces nos quedamos en las palabras bonitas, en los lindos discursos, nos quedamos en algunas de las frases más conmovedoras, pero realmente lo que necesitamos es pasar de la palabra a la acción y no quedarnos justamente en eso, hablando sobre inclusión sin incluir. Aprendí con el tiempo que las palabras pesan y que tenemos que ser muy cuidadosos a la hora de referirnos a otras personas cuando hablamos. Ahora podemos ver también qué pasó con COVID, con esta pandemia que puso de rodillas al mundo. No ha habido un solo país, un solo gobierno que haya podido escapar de la situación terrible y tenaz con la que el COVID eh, nos, nos atacó. Y pensemos ahora en la persona con discapacidad y COVID. Pues quiero decirles que justamente esa segregación, ese alto no pases, ese distanciamiento social, ese aislamiento del cual todos vivimos por la pandemia COVID, es justamente la normalidad de la persona con discapacidad siempre, sin COVID, siempre está viviendo en un mundo segregado, apartado, aislado y sobre todo discriminado. Y es que en las crisis como la que hemos vivido, las mayorías son mucho más importantes que las minorías. Las minorías en este caso son la población con discapacidad. Se le da mucho más valor a lo que pasa con las mayorías, porque vivimos en, en esa crisis, es entendible. Pero eso logra hacer que la población minoritaria se segregue aún más de lo que ya estaba. Gracias, una luna a la vez. Muchas gracias por esa introducción. Realmente quisiera preguntarles, what is the made? What is a flower made of? I have to switch to English. What is a flower made of? The obvious answer is a stem, leaves, and petals. Things you can easily see. But in reality, there's much more than that. A flower is also the soil that nurtured it. It's the rain that watered it. It's the sun that gave it light. Even space and time are part of its existence. If you remove any of these non-flower elements, the flower wouldn't exist. Humans are no different. Your body is made out of trillions of non-human cells that keeps you alive. In fact, you have the whole cosmos inside you from the air you breathe and the food you eat and to education you get, and the culture that shapes you. And then, there are your ancestors, generations of them fanning back through time. You remove any of these elements from yourself, you simply wouldn't be you. Human beings are not separate entities, instead, It's an interbeing combination of elements drawn from sources that exist between time and space. Children showcase this interbeing clearly. A child won't just look like her parents, she'll speak and act like them too. Similarly, if you look at her parents, you'll find traces of the children as well. So neither the child nor her parents or a separate self. They too deeply connected to exist independently. It is not only our genes that make us interbeings. In fact, it doesn't require sometimes personal contact. Look at my teacher Oscar in Panama. He doesn't have genetic children, but if you observe his students, you'll see that they move and speak like him. Even students who have only read his books and body traces of him. That's what I call adoption. So whether you're washing the dishes, working on a project, or practicing a skill, you have an opportunity to acknowledge that you are part of this breathing cell we call the world. And not only that, the world is part of you too. Albert Einstein once said, 
There are two ways of seeing the future. One is believing that miracles do not exist. And the other one is believing that everything is a miracle. I am for that, for the second one. I'm for the second one. We believe and we now live in times of labels. We have labels for everything. Political affiliation, gender, religious. Now we have the new one that is vaxxer or anti-vaxxers. We have labels for everything. The truth is that in short, we are all divided. There's no formula available to have a conversation with family or friends without feeling division. Let's think about your family WhatsApp group discussing COVID-19. Chances are that at least one or two of the group members do not agree with wearing a mask or keeping distance while gathering. And it is in large part because we are divided by labels since we were born. Some of them destructive. He says that we are more naturally we than we are me. Life started with we. And as time passes by, we transform it into me. Now let me do an exercise with you here in stage. Let's imagine for a moment that I, here, in front of you. I am a girl with disability. We make eye contact as I speak to you and you over there unconsciously think how this girl has been neglected over and over in her life. And also think that when this girl was born, her parents were so impacted that cried for months, years, maybe they're still crying. Try to realize, as you see me, how hard it was to get accepted in preschool, and how, it, how hard it was to finish high school. And the number of classmates in school that never spoke to me in the hallway or in the cafeteria. Now you look at me in the eyes and see behind them. Try to see how my spirit has been hurt one, two, so many times in my life. Well, this girl, this girl has been always, always been negative. She has been gazed in the streets with those looks that hurt her parents constantly see people looking at her at the mall, at the park, the club, at the school. And they've been asked, what is wrong with her? What happened? Who was your doctor? Is that genetic? Is she suffering? Do you have other children like her? Will she be able to talk or walk? Those are the questions that children, the, the parents of children with disability are asked every day. When you look through the eyes of that person with disabilities, you will be able to see her spirit, not her eyes, not her compromised body, not their short neck or their flattened face. You will be able to match your own spirit with hers and realize that it's nothing different, nothing toxic or segregated. It's just another flower. One out of five women in the world has disabilities. 
women and girls with disabilities face systemic barriers to participation and inclusion and represent an out of proportion percentage of the world's poor as a consequence of multiple forms of discrimination. This is especially true on women with disabilities who face multiple intersectional discriminations themselves. Now back to our labels. The real me is full of labels too. Vivian, the advertising woman, the youngest daughter of Tony Fergo. She is the former first lady of Panama. She's the activist. She's the mother, the wife of the president of Panama, the UN expert, and of course, the mother of Danny. Danny, my daughter, who is 20 years old with disability. My daughter, Danny, who graduated from college, who works at a radio station on a show speaking from the cabin about show business, the one who writes on her own blog on inclusion and dignity. Danny, the reason why, the reason why I am here, and in Geneva, with other 17 experts who together try to make the world better and more inclusive. Now the real me, the real Vivian Hernandez that is talking to you, has been labeled as well, although no apparent disabilities show on stage, they exist. The challenge is to take our own labels out of our lives while taking the ones that we put on others as well. And disability is the master of all labels. That is why now it is the time to dignify and to normalize disability. Let's have a world full of diversities. Let's be broad-minded on being different and respect all abilities. Let me take you through history and the different approaches disability has had. The first one, the very, very first one, was the religious or moral model. Under this model, the person with disability was seen as a sin, a punishment from God, a bad karma, wrong karma. They have no right to live in the mainstream society. They themselves are responsible for what and who they are. Then we go to the second one, the medical model. This model relies on the purely medical definition of disability. The person with disability is viewed as the problem and in need for treatment to be cured. With that model, started the special education, special institutions, sheltered workshops, special transport, etc. The individual with disability is in the sick role and always under medical focus, under medical scene. Then we have the other model, it's the charity model. This model treats the person with disability as a dependent upon society. It has an emotional appeal. This person is treated as helpless, victims needing care and protection. This model relies heavily on the charity and benevolence rather than justice and equality. This model accepts the acts of exclusion from social arrangements and services and the public services. Charity model justifies the exclusion from the mainstream education and employment and is only, only driven by sensitive appeals. This is when Teleton fundraising shows started. Then we get into the next model. It's the human rights model. This model promotes the creation of communities which accept diversity and accepts differences. 
This model affirms that all human beings, regardless of their disability, has rights. Have rights. It respects autonomy. It respects the freedom of choice. It focuses on equality and non-discrimination. This model emphasizes on viewing the person with disabilities as a subject and not an object. Thus, locating the problem outside the person. At the same time, it addresses the manners in which the economic and social process accommodates these differences. And the last model that I want to share with you is the economic model. This model tries to establish a link between the individual and society in terms of their contribution to productive capabilities towards the community. Unlike other models, this one suggests employability rather than changing the environment. The emphasis here is on health-related limitations on the amount and the kind of work to be performed. But, but, but where are we now? We've been through this one, but now, right now, where are we? Where is that flower that receives soil, sun, and rain? But maybe misses one petal, or two, or a stem. Well, disability movement has succeeded in changing that approach towards um, disability from the model of moral and religious and the charity model, but limited has been achieved in the direction of human rights model. Collective efforts on the part of persons with disability, their advocates, voluntary organizations, government, and society at large require to create a real world where abilities and disabilities are not seen on the basis of physical or mental impairment, but diverse ability. Ability. That was show, it was showed at its best last year during COVID-19. Year 2020 and year 2021, isolation and loneliness have only exacerbated these concerns, particularly for adults with disabilities. Social distancing guidelines have increased the social isolation, the loneliness, as their caregivers and family members have been unable to visit. The 1.3 billion people living with disabilities worldwide are no strangers to the kind of exclusion the coronavirus has forced on the rest of the population. They do know about it. And as we overcome the most terrible pandemic of recent times, a virus that kept society and world leaders on their knees, I would like to express my gratitude. Yes, my gratitude, although sadness and sorrow surrounded many families who lost their loved ones, we learned a lot from the pandemic. COVID-19 shuttered us and showed us that we depend on something much greater than ourselves. The pandemic made us appreciate the luxury and the abundance in which we live with products, freedoms, spaces, agendas, options, realizing that we took it from granted. It stopped our lives to show us how busy we have always been with our business. Now we know that there are other things more important than our business. Coronavirus allows us to put aside all our problems that seem so important, but now we know that other things are more important. Thank you for stopping the transport. The planet was begging for it, but we weren't listening. And thank you for the fear and the evaluation of our lives. Because we finally understand what it means to be all connected. We knew that the world had to change. And now we have an opportunity to do it from the beginning. Let's try to do that beginning without labels. 
Thank you very much. I believe that was the most inspiring conference that we have held here in Terra Auditorium, and I would like to ask you to have another grand applause for all our speakers. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Our time is up, and I hope you have all enjoyed it as much as I did. And we are looking forward to joining efforts to be more inclusive with people of determination. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening. Please enjoy our coffee break at the pre-function as well. And don't forget to visit the Panama Pavilion at Jubilee Park. Have a good evening. <laughs>